Blog Talk Radio. Uh... In any quiet moment, when you are breathing, the breath may flow out and pause of itself, or flow in and pause of itself. Here, experience opens into exquisite vastness with no beginning and no end. Embrace this infinity without reservation. Dive into it. Drink deeply. And emerge renewed. A selection from the Radiance Sutras. Thoughtfully donated by Josephine. Thank you, Josephine. Hello, everyone. Uh, Welcome to another conversation about your Kundalini Awakening experience. Uh, This is Chrisom, and uh, today, sadly, today, this this broadcast will have to be started without uh, Miss Santara. She's somewhere on the back roads of Ireland. And I don't know if any of you have been on the back roads of Ireland. Oh, my God, they're so narrow. They're just like kind of like a shady little path that... For some reason, they decided to make into a two-lane highway. (laughs) A lot of the cars have scratches on on the on the sides of the vehicles from from uh, kind of like sideswiping the 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 bushes. It's pretty narrow, but the Irish, you know, they they get around. They know how to do it. So you know, I tip my hat to them. So she is somewhere uh, between Cork and Kerry, I guess. And uh, I offer her, you know, thanks for her participation in putting the show on online, her and her husband, John, and the extended family. And, uh, oh, what is this? this? And uh, and so she'll probably join us when she gets there. So uh, today I would like to, first of all, let people know that they can, they can get the, some more of this information that you're about to hear at Kundalini Awakening Systems 1, the number one, dot com, or uh, Chrisom Kundalini on YouTube, or Facebook groups, Kundalini Awakening, exclamation point, or Kundalini Awakening Systems 2, Kundalini Healing, and uh, you know, the Kundalini Radiance community. So, with, oh, oh, yes, and of course I want to bring Her Holiness Rosemary on. And Rosemary, you are in the red. Hello. Hello, Kristen. Hi, Rosemary. Can you make your your announcement? I certainly can. That for all the world to know that a a glorious seminar is being prepared. All that's needed for our teacher to come, step in place, and begin. And we're working on that, talking to lots of people. It's September 27, 28, and my contact information, rosemaryg at usinternet.com or 651-452-3161. Thank you. And I'd like to extend my, my compliments to you and your organizational skills, Rosemary, and also to Eileen Loro. And her yeah. creative and, and expertise, you know, in, in uh, networking. And, uh, she she put on the first Minnesota uh, seminar there, and this is how we were graced uh, to be in Rosemary's presence. So thank you, Eileen. Indeed. All right, Rosemary. Any other announcements? Any any uh, showings of the movie or anything like that? Yes, there were. I think I have. About eight or nine more to go. What's your next one? one? Give us us your next next, one, just in case somebody. Next one is August. August the fourth. Okay. 
And there might be one something in there between. I'm still talking with people, so they have to get back to me. And okay. we are, I should say, tell people too, we are having working on having places for Christmas to address people. And uh, we, we don't have that complete yet either. My intention has been that that would include Rochester, and that's what I'm waiting to, to put in place for that to take place so down there too. technically speaking, I'm, I'm giving them addresses, right? Addresses? A little humor there. No. Oh. <laughs> okay, oh. my dear. Thank oh, you. Sorry, Thank you. Sorry. Now, I'm, this is a serious moment. I get two moments every week to do this, <laughs> so I don't go there. Well, but. what's been your most interesting you. uh, experience lately during this type of Kundalini outreach that you've been doing in the Twin Cities? Anything in particular, I've mentioned before a couple people that have shared with me their awakening process, and it it mm-hmm. is what we know to be so. Um, there are, that, that's a major one like that. Um, the couple new places that I've added have been uh, the, the, the co-ops. We have a number of, of uh co-ops here in town so that's that's where I have a couple screenings and then I've been taking material there in the the custom of Eileen as she has done before and there's one place that has just a big pillar outside filled with staples and when I went there I said this isn't going to work my goodness the wind comes along it'll be gone well I did get a call from somebody who had picked up the information that I left there on that precarious to me place so i i don't know very much when it gets down to it (laughs) well you know enough to get out there and do it so many thanks to you rosemary and many thanks to you as well eileen um and i would uh, like to take a moment to introduce the queen the celtic queen of questionable comforts especially on the back roads of ireland her Holiness, Amelia Santara. Welcome to the show, Amelia. <laughs> Thank awesome. you very much, Chrism. <laughs> Hello, Eileen. Hello, Rosemary. Good to be here. So we're just getting started here, getting getting things moving on. Where were you coming from? What 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 was happening to you on the road? Was it rainy? Is it? Rainy again? No, it's very, it's very nice. I've been traveling down from Dublin. I had a few days away with my family. I was um, showing them the delights of Newgrange and the areas where we we did the seminars here in Ireland. So and well, just to, and, refresh, uh, my, to refresh people about what we do, uh, Amelia Santara and I, as we do these Kundalini Awakening seminars in Ireland, we uh, most often now we've been doing it at a, at a place called Newgrange which is a Paleolithic uh, structure of multiple interpretive qualities, shall we say. And uh, every time we take a crew or a group of seminar attendees into the the inner chamber of Newgrange, uh, we typically get some uh, kundalini phenomena, such as uh, uh, purple lights or blue lights. Uh, Last one I saw, the last time I was there, was kind of like a, a three-inch diameter blue-white star burst right against one of the stones there. One of the old, old, well, they're all old. Don't get me wrong, they're all old. But one of the, uh, shall we say, less processed stones by, you know, mm-hmm. by the uh, current scientific uh, community. So, yeah, yeah, the uh, the... The New Grange experience is quite awesome, and, and please continue. You had a you had an experience, didn't you, this time? I did, yes, indeed. And um, I went. John and my two younger children were with me. And when you go into New Grange, they they have artificial light. You go into a very long, narrow tunnel, and then you go into the middle of of the the tomb itself, or or the the area itself, or I suppose the temple. And inside there, when they turn off the lights, it's very, very dark. And then they artificially um, simulate what happens on the 21st of December, which is the light coming in through the chamber. 
And when this happens, you see the light coming along the floor and begin to light up the chamber inside. Well, when it goes dark, that's when I would typically see lights or sometimes sheets of colour of blues in, in, in the chamber. But this time, there was no blue. I saw flashes, like little um, sparkles and some very bright um, lights as well in there during that time. And this time, every time I've gone quizzing, there has been a different tour guide. And again, I said to John and the children, I'm bound to have somebody that I have heard before. But no, it was with another new gentleman. And this man left the dark for quite a long time. So right. the phenomena right. that I saw there lasted quite a long time, you know. So wow. it was very cool. And yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's a wonderful place. I love visiting it. And it was lovely to bring the children there for the first time. There's and definitely we went to, a, a Kundalini connection to, to these uh, ancient, ancient Irish uh, megaliths and structures. Oh, there is, Chris. There is. I mean, Certainly stimulates. Them. It does. It does. I mean, from the moment that, that I go in there, um, it stimulates. The Kundalini is responding, the Kundalini within me, and the energy. And how does that, how that, does that feel for people who, who don't have Kundalini? How does that feel for you, Amelia? How does it feel for me, for people who have, who have Kundalini, is it? No, no, no. How does it okay. feel to have your Kundalini stimulated? Oh, it's very pleasant. It, it, um, it's very tactile. So it begins, first of all, there is an energetic um, response, which is a, a flow of energy up through my body. And then it's very tactile as well sometimes. And I can feel that going right up through. You know, sometimes it shoots right up my back. And my, um, what happened this time as well is I felt an expansion in my heart and my head. Um, and, and, you be, and the awareness of the energy that is there, it's very, very ancient. And, and, of course, the Kundalini is very ancient. And there is a Kundalini connection with the people, the people who lived there, the people who built Newgrange. It's very interesting to hear them talking about the, you know, people who lived in the megalithic times and how they built this before the invention of the wheel. And it makes me laugh because, you know, they have all these theories as to how it was built, blah, 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 blah. And yet it is so mathematically and incredibly technical that they had this mathematical information, but they hadn't invented the wheel. Hello? It, I mean, the more I go there, the more the more absurd it is that these people, um, you know, they talk about two polar, um, we'll say, things existing at the same time with these people, you know. They hadn't invented the wheel and they were farmers and, you know, it, it just can't be. It just can't be. And, and the Kundalini, I think, rec- you know, well, it recognizes itself, Chrism, because it, that, that was definitely part of what was there during um, Newgrange. I have no doubt of that now. No doubt. Well, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I haven't had any doubts for a while with it. For me, when, yeah. when my company is stimulated that way, you know, I get a real strong, solid flow of energy up the spine and radiating outwards. And you can feel it coming off the top of your head, off the sides of your head, feeling it right now, as a matter of fact. And, <laughs> and that's just, it's just really, it's an omnipresent, for me, it's kind of like just a, an inside out glow that has a focal point, which would be the spine. Yes. Well, I, sure. it wasn't just, um, I have had it. I have had that experience stronger before than this time. I must say, and um, this time it was more. Um, gosh, it seems you know to say low key, but it was at a lower at a lower level, but still very very present, you know, but not as strong. So are you it's hanging very, out? Very some, are you hanging out at a truck stop right now in order to do the show? No, I, I came home, so I, um, I was in a truck stop. I, I stopped in the truck stop to actually put up the announcement um, about the show on the group. 
Didn't we have a conversation? I, I kind of like asked you to stop hanging out at truck stops. <laughs> no. I'm I'm often getting well, so used to them now. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's part of the questionable comfort. I got you. Okay. <laughs> Indeed. So we had a wonderful time, and we went to Nose as well, which is another um, and another five yeah. five thousand year old um, megalithic site. That's and and maybe the next time we have a seminar, Chris, and um, you know we haven't brought people there yet, and and it's a very different um, yeah. it's a very different experience very, there. Very different energy. That's right. It's very cool. Yeah. Ireland is so blessed. Ireland is definitely a place to go if you want to experience uh, primitive uh, primitive civilization kundalini stimulation. It's very, very yeah. cool. Uh, and okay. I just want that one last thing that we, you've never been. I went to Trim Castle, and Trim Castle is a castle from, you know, the 11th, 12th, 13th century, and it has a wonderful history, but it also is where they filmed Braveheart. And so my son was very interested in that, and, and that was a very interesting experience as well. So it's very, very modern compared to Newgrange, but all the same, very interesting, with a very, very interesting history um, of Ireland attached to, you know, how that castle evolved and how that castle turned into a ruin and, and the whole history of the place. So that was another interesting thing we did today. Well, you, you, live, a, you live a good life, Amelia. I do. I do, and I'm blessed indeed. All righty. Well, speaking of blessings, let's, let's talk about blessings. Uh, lately, a lot of people have been coming to me about having kundalini uh, phenomena in such a strong way that it takes their focus off of their day-to-day -day activities. And the first thing I'd like to really begin to have a person look at uh, with that regard is which one is more important to you right now? Is it the Kundalini, this, this amazing divine energy experience that not everybody gets to experience in one lifetime? Or is it uh, taking out the garbage at the right time? Or is it, uh, you know, getting everything done on the shopping list? Or is it, you know, is it pushing you to manage your time in a way that is different and therefore in a way that uh, your ego begins to resist? And because most of us in our early Kundalini Awakening experience uh, is, are, are still quite uh, controlled, by the wants and desires of the ego, the wants and desires of being at ease with life and, and having life be the way you want it. I was having another conversation and, you know, some guy was saying, well, we all create our own reality. And, and you know, to a degree, I, I you know, I can't argue with that at all. But it also... You know, that there's a lot of assumptions behind that statement that you even know what a reality is, that that uh, who is it that's doing the creating of the reality, what aspect of the person, what, you know, there, it just goes on and on and on. You know, and it kind of it reminds me of the, of the catch-all, you know, easy phrases that you hear a lot in the New Age communities about, you know, let go and let God, or, you know, some other saying that that really attempts to sugarcoat uh, some of the mystical and spiritual experiences that people can have. Uh, with the Kundalini, you can sugarcoat it all you want, but you're still going to have to have that Kriya. <laughs> you know, there can be as many fluffy bunnies and floating, you know, gingerbread bears in the air, sugar plum fairies. But you're still going to have to have that Kriya. <laughs> now, it doesn't have to be as bad as it would have been before you knew what was happening. Now that you know what is happening, uh, all of your phenomena are going to change their reception by you as you experience them, all of them. Knowledge really is, is, a, is a grace within the Kundalini. And, and, of course, you know, I have to... I have to <laughs> 
I, unfortunately, I have to add the caveat, shall we say, cor- not correct knowledge, but appropriate knowledge, knowledge that has levels of truth and application, uh, have very, very, very strong resonance within your kundalini awakening event. It, it begins to mitigate the fear. Fear mitigation is one of the most important characteristics of a of a, an enjoyable participatory event with the kundalini. If you can mitigate your fear, then you can begin to enjoy the whole process. Seriously, enjoy it. Oh, sure, you'll get your challenges. You get your challenges, but you know how to control, you know how to mitigate fear, and so you make the choices in dealing or working with the challenge or through the challenge uh, without the... the um, you know, the, the, the ball and chain of the fear getting in the way. Okay, so fear mitigation is really, really important. So, yeah, let, let's validate some of the difficult things that happen within the Kundalini. Let's not try to, to glissando over that. Let's not try to hide it. I don't try to hide about the, the dark night soul for people or Kundalini syndrome for people or... Or, you know, the negative aspects of entities, which really there are only negative aspects to entities. I know that's a, that's a terribly polaristic say, thing to say, but for the most part, you know, they're a challenge to be dealt with rather than to be engaged in. It's a test. Um, Yogananda, early in his career, they were all, they were traveling somewhere with his teacher and, uh, they were in a tent, and if you've ever been to some place like the Amazon or India or somewhere, you know, close to the equator that way, the, the, the numbers of mosquitoes per square inch are just amazing, just, just amazing. And uh, so, of course, Yogananda was having a mosquito problem, slapping at him, or just he didn't want to kill him, right? He knew that that was wrong, so he, he could just, like, wave at him, try to wave them away, and... You know, he wasn't able to, to get sleep, and his, and his teacher uh, woke up, who, who wasn't being bothered by any mosquitoes. He said, you know, you just have to allow them to be away. You don't have to, to push at them with the palms of your hands. You just have to allow it to occur. And eventually, after many mosquito bites... Uh, Yogananda did learn how to how to control the mosquitoes. Of course, you know I don't know that he ever went to the Amazon, where the mosquitoes are of a particularly aggressive uh, quality. But I'm sure India has some pretty bad ones too. Bad in the sense that you know they're very aggressive towards sucking your blood. Good uh, in every other respect because they're uh, a creation of divinity. They're a creation of God, and they're also a, a very substantial chain. In the, in the food chain for, for many different creatures, including a lot of birds and bats and things like that. So, yeah, not, not, not saying that we should get rid of mosquitoes at all. Uh, but anyway, so, so as these blessings come upon you, these kundalini phenomena blessings, uh, really begin to mitigate your fear. Eating. Is really good. So, so let's just say all of a sudden you're, you know, you're having waking visions and, or you're seeing entities. And, and you know, unlike uh, Amelia's experience in, the, in, in Newgrange, you know, where the lights go off and that's when the phenomena begins. For me, the, the phenomena is more when the lights are on. <laughs> the lights are on. I, I see more phenomena that way. But that's just me. The thing uh, with, with, uh, with Amelia's, uh, experience over there uh, with Kundalini, you're going to get it one way or the other. Whether it's uh, you know feeling like somebody's walking on the top of your head, like little people walking on top of your head, or dancing around, or fizzing and zipping and zapping at the top of your head, and, and you know these things are going to cause you concern. But because you have the knowledge, you have the information, your uh, your understandings need not be flavored with so much fear as if you didn't know like I didn't know what was going on and so you know I had lots of fear flavoring <laughs> certainly in the early part of the uh, of the awakening so 
So keep that in mind for those of you who are new to this experience. Uh, you got to learn how to deal with your fear. And it's not easy. And it won't be easy. But you can't avoid it because the Kundalini will bring this stuff up. Very similar to, to the ayahuasca experience in that, in that regards, where the ayahuasca experience is a, is a tea that's brewed out of Liliana vines in the uh, Amazon basin. It's fairly well known these days as ayahuasca or la perga, you know, what they call it in Spanish down there. And uh, when you take the tea and you wait 20 minutes and you take another shot of the tea and it's a really interesting tasting tea, um, ayahuasca begins to manifest certain issues that are causing you blockage or causing you, um, uh, shall we say, dissonance on your spiritual path. And so the ayahuasca will come to you in a certain way. Sometimes a person will hear a voice, sometimes a talking animal, a talking uh, snake or a talking uh, big cat like a, like a leopard or a black panther or something like that. You know, uh, and sometimes just the plant itself give you a, a empathic information level. When I when I had my experience, you know, the first thing I saw was a giant snake encircling the world, which, you know, basically was, you know, telling me this is a kundalini world, and uh, everybody here is, is striving towards having kundalini, uh, not saying that everybody's going to get it all at the same time, but the striving for is the important part of the journey anyway. And uh, so as the people go through their their spiritual evolutions, uh, life after life, uh, you know, they they come closer and closer and closer to what a lot of the people listening to this program have right now, and that is awakened kundalini. And that sets into place a whole different level of spiritual and physical evolution. Okay. And that evolution comes with phenomena, and that phenomena can be scary. And the fear mitigation is what I want to talk about uh, today. Now, here's one of the things that that we have is uh, people, Kundalini people will sometimes have really, really excellent memories. And that that is a good thing on the one hand. But on the other hand, it can be kind of challenging as well because you don't forget details. You don't forget things too easily. And this. This can feed itself into levels of OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, a lot of comp- a lot of Kundalini, Kundalini people will have OCD. Uh, it seems to be very, very, very commonplace within the Kundalini population, and it is not the kind of OCD that that I think Howard Hughes had or Leonardo DiCaprio had portraying Howard Hughes. <laughs> I always wondered about that casting choice, but anyway. Um, yeah, the OCD that a Kundalini awakened person would have is, is subtle, uh, but it can be uh, challenging as well. But once that's under control and the Kundalini is able to flow, the OCD aspects generally work themselves out. You don't need to take SSRIs or some newfangled pharmaceutical engineered, you know, drug or or chemical or solvent. Uh, You don't need to take that into your body. You can just allow your body to to find its own balances. You don't need to drop a pill for every phenomenon. Not that any of you do, of course, but, you know, figuratively speaking. Uh, You don't need to do that. You don't need to, to... you know, uh, mitigate kundalini phenomena by, by, you know, what different pharmaceuticals you can ingest. Okay, that, that typically really begins to warp a person's perception. And a person making important life-changing de- uh, decisions from a warped uh, mental and emotional perspective given, uh, you know, vis-a-vis these drugs is not a good combination. Not a good combination for happiness in this society. Uh, you know, keeping in mind what I said earlier about always searching, you know, for happiness. You know, there is a middle path. There is a middle way where you can partake of happiness and 
and, and not be overly attached to it. Partake of ease, but not being overly attached to it. Not doing it for aspects of ego, uh, ego desires, you know. The ego, you know, wants that candy bar. But your blood sugar doesn't want that candy bar. <laughs> Who wins, right? So the blood sugar is going to have to win. But, it's, it, you know, it can be a fight that sometimes you lose. Sometimes you lose. With Kundalini, Kundalini knows what it wants you to have. And it will allow you to deviate to some degree, but, but it's always going to circle back to what it wants you to have. And eventually, what it wants you to have. It just may take you a while to get there. If you have any questions about this or any other aspect of your Kundalini Awakening experience, uh, feel free to call 347-934-0026. That's 347-934-0026. I'd like to welcome... Uh, Julie and EDG, otherwise known as Elizabeth Dalton Gonzalez. Hello, Elizabeth. Fast G, guest sixteen thirteen, and Mike Strong. Hello, everybody, and hello, everybody that I cannot see. I, I understand that um, uh, Blog Talk Radio only lets me see a certain amount of people. I don't know, maybe it's just the people that are logged in, but I also understand that there are plenty of other people that are listening. Uh, live to the program. I'd like to welcome all of the unseen listeners right now. I'd also like to welcome the people that are listening in the future in the archives. Fear mitigation. Uh, Miss Centara, what do you have to say about that? About fear mitigation, um, it was one of the the best things that happened to me. I lived for quite a number of years with fear around an awful lot of things. Now, when my kundalini, um, I'm trying to cut to the, to the point, really, there came a time when, there was, when I had fear, when I knew I had a choice cousin, to have fear or not fear because I had experienced both. I had, and um, one of the things that um, you, from the very moment that I came onto the CARS group that I read at the very beginning was, you know, that the CARS community did not operate from a place of fear. And um, on reading, it made a huge difference to me. And so that was something that happened relatively early on in my um, Kundalini no. awakening. That was, that was, it was beer. It wasn't fear. <laughs> Well, actually, now that you mentioned beer, uh, when you were talking about blessings and, you know, um, the different things that happen at the beginning of, of a process and um, how much time, you know, the, the change that, that happens and how much time do you want to give to your old life or your familiar life and how much to your Kundalini, what's the important thing to do? And talking of beer... <laughs> That, you know, the social aspect of my life changed hugely when my Kundalini awakened. That's what I was thinking of, actually. And um, so I, I lost interest in continuing my social life. Um, not instantly, but I, I began to withdraw from that. Um, and there was pressure on me to continue doing that. Um, this would be otherwise and, known as a pub crawl, right? <laughs> well, no, not <laughs> yeah. If I was younger, perhaps. <laughs> but, um, no, we would can just you, can you, you know can go you to the one pub and stay there all night. <laughs> can you explain to people what a pub crawl is in Ireland? <gasps> oh my God, I'm sure people know, but let me explain for those people who don't. Um, a pub crawl is where you begin on in the first pub, and you have one drink there, and then you move to the next pub, and you have another drink there. And so it continues and it continues. So you would visit quite a few a few pubs until during during an evening. Stand up, until you're crawling on your stomach <laughs> into the next pub. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> it's very much part of I mean, I'm not too sure about the UK, but it would be very much part of the culture here. And so um that would have been very much part of, you know, my my social scene and um, 
you know, that changed completely when I when my Kundalini awakened. It just I just lost all interest. It just wasn't something I wanted to do anymore. And so, um, yeah. And it sounds fine. Oh, you lost interest in that, but it wasn't as easy as that because, you know, um, my dear beloved husband also didn't have any change in his life. He was still interested in doing that. And so I had to assert that things had changed for me. And I also, at that time, you know, I wanted to be alone with the Kundalini a lot. Um, So there was a lot of things that I had to choose, you know, um, at the beginning, what was important to me um, for the blessings that, that, that were being given, you know. You're lucky that you got to choose... Can you say more? How can you? When you, you say get, that, I got not everybody, to choose. Not everybody gets to choose. Not everybody gets to choose. At least, from a from a five sense corporeal standpoint, from a from a spiritual evolution, we all choose. We all choose. Okay. So, but but when you're having yep. phenomena, you know, say say you're you're in your five sense uh, body, and you're having phenomena. Well, you're having phenomena that. Science can't explain, and you just spent, you know, somewhere, you know, anywhere from 12 to, to, uh, you know, 15, 16 years of your life being told that science has all the answers, and anything else that's not science is just fantasy. And oh, well, this is happening to me, and even science doesn't say it's real, but the, you know, the stuff that I read in other areas say it is. And that that's enough to of an imbalance to to make a person feel that they're exquisitely losing their sanity. Yeah, yeah. I there was been a lot of that before. I I would have experienced that before, but not not at the particular time that I'm talking about when the fear was gone. But you know when the fear when that when that everything changes, everything changes once that threshold is that the right was probably not the right but once that has breached the fear um well for me anyway let me say that everything changed uh, once the fear once you know once that yeah fear, fear mitigation really is is one of the most helpful things that you can do and let's go back to to my joke about beer uh beer uh, will bring you know alcoholic consumption will bring on uh more of a causation for fear uh, in many people. I won't say all people because, you, know, you know, I don't think that's true. I think some people have a different resistance to it. But uh, with Kundalini people, because you're, the veil is already thinning, to introduce alcohol into the equation is to introduce uh, levels of, uh, shall we say, intrusive pests coming into your spiritual equation and, and giving you a rough time, at least until in, until the hangover and then the body uh, and the energetic anatomy restore balance to the, uh, to the ener- energetic envelope around the body. Uh, whereas, whereas if you're, you know, you're a, a methamphetamine user or somebody, something like that, you know, those holes are much harder to heal. You know, so any of those white powders you do want to steer clear of. You know, regardless of DEA or any of that stuff, you you do want to steer clear them from a Kundalini perspective. You know, the cocaines or the meth or the whatever other names they have for it. Okay. Um, uh, continue, Santara, please. Well, just about the fear prism. I mean, I I spent a lot of years and. Um, being fearful. So when I realized and, and, and totally, when I got the teachings, when I understood what had happened to me, in, with, that it was Kundalini, that it was, that other people had experienced things. When I, when I retrospectively looked back with what the information that I was given, well then, everything changed too, you know. I could never go back to the, to, the fear that was there before I had this information. It was it was a wonderful freedom. I mean everybody who listens to this this show and everybody who reads the um 
the teachings um, that you, you know, you give on YouTube or that you, you can come across in written form on any of the groups, when people receive that information, it must, I feel, make a big difference to their equation because they will recognize that what is happening is a reality. You, you can let all the other stuff go because you know, that it ha- you know what you've experienced. And when you hear then, you know, a validation for that, it, it, it makes a huge difference, I feel, anyway. Um, and then, again, you have the choice to either, the cho- in inverted commas now, because I understand that thing about choice, but you have the choice then that when things become very wild, let's say, or very um, extreme in a Kundalini context, it's not that things aren't, you know, strange and wonderfully nutty after that. It's just the response to what the Kundalini does isn't from a place of fear. It's from a place of acceptance and not resisting and surrendering to what is happening. And it makes all the it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. It's yeah. For me, well, that's how, my your fear, how did you get over your fear of going, say, into the devotional aspect? You know, and you know, how were you able to mitigate those fears? Um Okay, well, from to begin with, devotion, because I was brought up in a Catholic Christian tradition, I had some experience of devotion. And so it wasn't totally alien to me. Now, it was and it wasn't. But I, I also, I had some experience of spontaneous devotion in my own Kundalini awakening experience. So I had that. When I began my devotion, um. I suppose fears actually, you know, sort of bubbled up and I I began to, how they were mitigated was I made a choice and once I knew I was being pulled by the Kundalini to devotion, I knew it. And you know when the Kundalini is pulling you, there's a certain um, um, space there for you to consider. (laughs) kind of (laughs) and so you can resist a bit in that and so I knew I was being pulled and I and I knew that it was what I was to do and so again I made the choice to go with that and do it and so it was just by practicing just by beginning by allowing um what rose up and to just come up and let it go and continue on um so that it was the practice of it, and it was the trust, and I trusted completely that this was what my Kundalini wanted to do. My ego wasn't so sure, and so it's recognizing in myself when my ego comes up and goes, no, no I don't know now, for God's sake, you know, this, you know, blah blah blah. Just knowing that that wasn't where I was going to go, I wasn't going to follow my ego. So by practicing, let's say the Tataka. And beginning, say, with that as an example of the beginning of, which was actually the beginning of my devotional practice, continuing with that, just, just, it was a practice. I had committed to it, and I continued with it. And so um, that became a process then. Well, um, yeah, be- because I'm- of the practice, because of the practice of devotion, uh, what has been occurring uh, with regards to your uh, Kundalini lately with regards to your communication with it and its communication with you? Oh, Chris, um, oh my goodness, I, I can't pick really put words on it, oh, except to say that, okay, I, I pick some aspects. The, the interesting thing, the thing about being in devotion is that it expands with the love within me. The love for my teacher, the love for my Kundalini is so intense and so strong. And so it is like that. For example, um, you know, if John is listening outside in the other room, I don't know if he's tuned in or not yet. I think he'd agree that there is more love between us. There's, uh, there's more love happening and expanding into my life with my children, into my community. 
So that's an aspect that I feel um, expanding into everything in my life. Um, and the devotion is, is uh, what is it? The devotion is the reason, actually, that that is happening. Um, so that, that, I mean, that's huge. I can't, I mean, even that alone is, is, is absolutely huge. And then there's other aspects as well, because the, the, the communication between me and my, commu- my Kundalini and the different um, dimensions or layers that are happening for me. Not to, and I, I'm not even going to go into the phenomena because, you know, it's not that important, but it's phenomenal, phenomenal, really. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I. Yeah. But it's it's, it's really in the in the everyday living of my life. It's just, I mean, it's such a blessing. It's such a joy. It's it's incredible. It impacts on everything, and I think everybody should be devoted. <laughs> because when you experience it, you would wish it for everybody to know. And I cannot help but want people to experience it. Why wouldn't I? You know. Well, the same thing happens with the spinal sweep. You know, it, it feels so good. Yeah. It's so amazing. You want everybody to know about it. Everybody should be able to feel this way. And and then, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to be the case all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> true, true, true. Well, thank, yeah. you. thank you for your explanation. I think that was a very good description. So, yeah, so as, as, as Amelia said, you know, the practice of a certain quality for fear mitigation can bring it on. You don't want to just do something one time and expect, you know, some sort of magical fairy dust to fall upon the situation and instantly resolve. Uh, we need to clean up our own messes, really, and the Kundalini will allow us, uh, in order to learn how to use our new tools, well, then, yeah, we get to learn sometimes how to use some of the Siddic skills to, to clean up some of our ego-based messes but for the most part, we have to uh, we have to clean up our own messes just from standpoint of a karmic level. You know what what is done must be paid for or at least balanced, and uh, and so that is that is never taken out of the equation. People always tend to forget the whole karmic thing, you know. And the karmic thing is a very important thing. It will control the the flavor, the level, and the the the. the the power of a, of a kundalini awakening, even if the person is going to have one at all, you know, it's based upon the karma. And it's not to say like, you know, some, some belief systems think that, oh, once you have kundalini, well then, oh, you don't have to ever come back in a body again. And, you know, you're, you're a saint and, you know, you'll always get toys for Christmas after that. It's not necessarily true either. You know, a lot of it depends on how you accept the kundalini. I mean, what kind of, what kind of fear barriers develop when it first comes to you? And how do you respond to your life based upon those fear barriers and those levels of paranoia? Are you able to, to scale back the paranoia? And if not, where does the paranoia send you? That type of thing. So this is why I wanted to have this show about fear mitigation. Eat food. Eat food. Uh, if you're in a if you're in a scary situation uh, vis-a-vis Kundalini, uh, say you're see you're seeing some nasty phenomena, whatever, uh, have a bite to eat. Have some water. It grounds you. It grounds you. And as as ludicrous as that sounds, when you're terrified, if you just go get a glass of water or just you know, think of your favorite ice cream or whatever. Uh, it tends to take a bit of the sting out of the fear. And, of course, the other way uh, is one of the ways that I state in the safeties is to think of a time when you're happy and pull that time from the past into your present moment. Allow, allow that memory engram to do more than one job. Allow it to, to live again. Uh, but allow it that memory to serve a purpose for your current serenity. It's important that you, you you have some levels of serenity. Now, it's not all about being relaxed. You know, a lot of the meditation t- 
teachers, yoga instructors, whatever, you know, oh, just relax, breathe, relax, you know. You know, with the Kundalini, you know, they can tell you to relax all you want, but the Kundalini is going to tighten up muscle groups that it wants to tighten up, and they're going to go tight. Okay, that whole diaphragm muscular system can tighten up and stay tight, stay hard, stay stay tensed in a way because of the the uh, the the electrical like qualities of the Kundalini energy when it when it uh, inserts itself upon the energetic anatomy and therefore inserts itself into the to the neural activity. You know, the, the, the jolt can be strong, can be sustained. I've had experiences that are like sitting on an 8,000-volt line. It tosses you. Um, those things can, can scare you. Those things can actually terrify you, okay, as can the entities. And so you, you really need to, to, to go, okay, what can I use to modulate my fear no matter what? So you can use the, the, the secret smile. A lot of the, some of the Asian-based martial artist techniques talk about a secret smile. I think it's a Taoist uh, technique, actually. I think Mike Strong would probably know more. Uh, the secret smile is there to keep you in a very, very specific state of mind that is not anxious or it is not, uh, uh, you know, deliberately, uh, uh, you know, screwing itself up by harboring bad thoughts or hurtful thoughts or negative thoughts, things of that nature. The secret smile uh, is used to maintain inner calm and inner purity, clarity. Uh, it doesn't mean you're, you're you're lazy or you're not fast, quick on your feet. Obviously, uh, with martial artists, you know you're going to have to be that way at some period or point. Uh, yeah, the yeah the inner smile. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And so that's another option. That's another option. You know, what I tell people sometimes when they're seeing a lot of weird entity activities, is, well, hey, you know, just see them as cartoons. You got cartoons coming out of the wall. That's all it is. Go back to sleep. <laughs> you know, try to see it and, you know, try to reinterpret the experience through something that is less fearful. Now, there are some entities that are out there just to scare. That is what they do. The tall guys with the pointy hats, they're great for that. But any, you know, there's a bunch of different kinds that, you know, they're fear feeders. They like to feed off of the fear that you emanate based upon them terrorizing you. Uh, yeah, so you will feel fear with them. They push it right at you. It's, it's really interesting. Never, Never knew that fear or a quality of terror could be like launched at you like a fear missile or something like that. And they do that. But you don't have to buy into it even then. You know, they can explode the fear all around you, all they want. And the only person that will take it up is those who don't know what's going on because they don't know. Fear of the unknown equals they don't know. And therefore, you know, that fear is very much harder to mitigate. You know. You know that these entities can come in every shape and form and disguise and whatever, and that the Kundalini will allow you to have these entity interactions in order to teach you how not to fear, how to control your fear, how to control your inner serenity. Tongue up behind your upper front teeth. If you start remembering some of the bases, Kubera Mudra is very good. Uh, Kubera Mudra is when you have your your middle finger, your pointer finger, and your thumb tip all together, and your two other fingers buried into the center of your palm together. Okay, that's the Kubera Mudra. You can look that up, K-U-B-E-R-A Mudra. That's a great one. For fear. Matter of fact, uh, if any of you are familiar with John of God in Brazil, that's the Mudra that uh, John of God uh, uses also uh, to mitigate healing. I would use it as I, you know, when you're, uh, you know, in some places, not so many places these days, but in some places back then, uh, when you were American, you were seen as kind of like a dollar sign with legs. 
And as you travel, as you walk, you know, through some of these really hard-pressed areas, people were kind of calculating how easy would it be to relieve that Americano of any paperweight he may have. <laughs> and I could sense that, and I could feel that. And I didn't have so much of a concern, but I, my hands went automatically into Kubera. And after that, I didn't really have much of a worry about any of that stuff anymore, and I never had a problem. Uh, so you can adopt a, a certain physical position to begin to help you mitigate your fear. And Kubera Mudra is a good one for that. You can also do Gyan Mudra. As you wake up in, in bed, uh, having Kundalini phenomena, say uh, you'll be having Kriyas, uh, one of the most common Kriyas you'll have is the Gyan Mudra, and that's the, the, the pointer finger and the thumb tip together. Pointer finger, also known as the index finger. And then the other three fingers, not touching and spread apart. Gyan, G-Y-A-N, mudra, finger position. That's another way to help you mitigate your fear. Um, really do your best. Now, in laughter yoga, in laughter yoga, uh, you force yourself to laugh. You know, you'll come in from the office, say, or from the freeway or whatever, you'll be a little bit frustrated, maybe a lot of toxic gases you've been breathing in because you, you forgot to do the... Uh, the uh, it, the recycle air button on the inside of your car. So now you have all this toxic nitric sulfur, nitrogen dioxide fumes in your lungs and you're, you're a little nuts right now. And so as you come in and, and you begin to do, you know, some of these relaxing, or you say a mudra or something like that, you can just immediately adopt a mudra and that mudra can begin to mitigate healing into, into those damaged areas. Uh, when you live in a big city, when you live in Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, uh, Miami, um, you know, Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, any of these areas, L.A., ha, strong levels of toxicities are breathed in, just the general atmosphere. So you do want to remember that recycle the cabin air button on your car or truck. You know, breathe the clean air as best you can wherever you live. So mitigating fear, mitigating fear will really, really begin to, to bring about uh, levels of, of serenity and levels of calmness during some of the stronger phenomena. Uh, as you mitigate it earlier and earlier, then the stronger the phenomena that comes, you'll be able to make choices about it and learn the lessons that this phenomena is teaching you rather than running, screaming, and yelling that, you know, you know, I'm being chased by this or that. Or or secretly having this interferes like, oh my God, I don't have a libido anymore. You know, then beginning to redesign your social uh, life because of your libido uh, issue that you feel that you have because the Kundalini has come and she's she's using your creative energies for other reasons, other purposes within your personal transformation. But all you, you, all the guys is like, oh, geez, I, I can't get an erection. Oh, my God, my life is over, you know, type of thing. And, and, and so, yeah, mitigate the fear. Mitigate the fear. Realize that what, what, what Santara said is absolutely true. When the Kundalini happens to you, everything changes. Everything changes across the board. Uh, not all at once, perhaps. You know, maybe you get big chunks here, little chunks there, medium-sized chunks later on. But it all comes together into your awakening kundalini equation. And it's never easy for most folks. Even Yogananda, you know, wasn't easy for him either. He had to learn it just the same way you and I are, are learning from it. Now, he had his flesh teacher, and uh, that is also very helpful. I never used to be very teacher-oriented, I'll tell you what. Um, there weren't any teacher offerings at the time either. So, <laughs> You know, when my kundalini came up, there were no teachers that were saying, oh, they didn't even know the word kundalini. Very few. Very few knew about it. And very few knew or were, were able to have the energetic signature that 
when the Kundalini came, it would amplify certain traits that were already within the within the individual, certain psychic traits, certain Kundalini uh, awakened traits that that came uh, from another lifetime having Kundalini. I haven't found too many of those. I, you know, put out a put out a, a heads up for those folks. I'd like to know who they are. I send I send people their way. If you have any questions about your Kundalini awakening experience, about this subject or any other subject pertaining to that, feel free to give a call at three four seven nine three four zero zero two six. And I see. Santara's gone to the blue, but she's desperately coming back into the red right now. Here she is. Hello. <laughs> I just noticed um, a, a message there from Elizabeth from earlier. She said, we must have been speaking about Newgrange, and I'd just like to say, I see the message there, Elizabeth. She says, my Kundalini started firing just while looking at your pictures of Newgrange last night. I posted some photographs, so... She's saying her Kundalini started firing just looking at those pictures. So that's interesting, isn't it? From from, the, from all the way where she's living, it was recognised. Where does she live? Well, she's not living in Ireland. She's living in America. But just looking at the photographs, her Kundalini responded. Oh, sure, absolutely. I, you know, I wouldn't doubt that. Yeah. Uh, the same with that other big rock pile out there in England. What's that called? Oh, yes. The um, not New Grange, the other one. Yep. To, um, yep. Blah, blah, blah. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in the chat room, what are we talking about? <laughs> the one where we have the huge standing stones. Um, I've been there for the sake. <laughs> <laughs> Kundalini is just after taking it right out of my head. <laughs> Do you know what I wanted to say too, Chris? I mean, one of the wonderful things about not having fear is that um, it's to do, you, you talked about this, it's about the physical things that happen in my body. I mean, you know, I remember when my, like right in underneath my sternum, when I had a constant stitch and a constant pain where um, this was going on and it went, and in my ribs, and there was an awful lot of activity going on in there. I remember having huge activity in my heart area, pains in my heart, um, even recently, again, you know, there was an awful lot of things going on in my head. And my, my mom died of a brain tumor. And it would be very easy for me with what was going on in my head there for the last couple of weeks to go into fear. But because I don't have that and because I know it's Kundalini, it's a blessing because I don't have to go into that place. I'm able to... Um, allow these things it's you know when i'm speaking it's not that i'm going around all the time going whoa this is you know there's a lot of stuff that can be challenging as well but when you don't have the fear when i don't have the fear it makes it so much it's okay to have these things going on in my body i can live with them and very happily and very okay so it's not that fear makes these things stop in the sense that they're still in the body, but the response to them is very, very different. Yeah, it's the response that really matters. How you respond to your fear will, will, will determine how you experience your fear. And so really, you know, uh, do your best. If you know it's kundalini, then really, really look up the symptoms of kundalini uh, as best you can. Find the information source that, that fits your fits your kundalini the best you'll know uh, a true source when you hear it and you know it doesn't have to be this program it can be other people um but get that information and empower yourself during this process it's, it's a huge level of responsibility of self-responsibility to for us to to let you know some of the the less constructive aspects of our ego you know, out of the choice-making position, the decision-making spot, okay? Take the, the ego out of it because the ego will make the decisions based in fear or want or gain or attachment, 
I mean, you, you name it. It'll go for all of those qualities where, in fact, we want to train it to go for the noble behaviors such as forgiveness, compassion, tolerance, honesty, you know, things, love, things of a, of, a, of a happiness and not necessarily eradicating all dark because you have to have some dark to have light, but, you know, necessarily uh, responding in different ways that uh, are far more positive with regards to the kundalini agenda within the body. Now, for our friends who are listening to this, as they slumber, I would like to give them some alms. These are for you, my friends. These are for you who slumber, sleep, listen to this program. These alms are for you. this information feed your kundalini equation whether it's awakened or activated or just seeking information to do either one sleep the sleep of love sleep the sleep of peace and we'll continue with our program fear mitigation is very very important so when you start seeing uh, waking visions like i get to see you know you see something that's happening while you're awake right in front of you and you know that it's of a shall we say non-physical quality, but there you are seeing it with your physical eyes in your physical environment. Uh, If you don't know that kind of phenomena, that can scare you. And so, once again, you need to look at what what it is that's occurring to you. You're having kundalini. Kundalini is opening up places of discernment and and, uh, perception that you never had before and that people around you currently do not have. So you will see things that they don't see. You will hear things that they don't hear. You will be touched and you will touch uh, things that nobody else can see or feel. This is what what it means to have your, your, your horizon broadened by the Kundalini. This is what it means to have uh, some of these extra gifts that come with the Kundalini. It's not all, you know, let's be Superman or Catwoman or... Batman or some other insect person. <laughs> okay, it's not about that. It's about, you know, embracing the skills that the Kundalini wants you to have. It knows what your karmic relevancy is. It knows that. So based upon that relevancy will determine the the quality scope and level of the of the skill sets that your kundalini is bringing to you. It's not that once you've reached this uh, plateau, then then all previous bets are off. It's not that at all. We still have work to do. A lot of work. Even after the awakening, even as we go into enlightenment. Enlightenment isn't the, the, the golden sunset where you just kind of hang out there at the... Uh, edge of the world, you know, playing around in endless sunlight, like in Hawaii. (laughs) I know you guys didn't know this, but life is not that way. Certainly not Kundalini life. It's a vertical learning experience, and verticality can also bring about levels of fear. Uh, A rapidness, if you have a really rapid... uh, Equation. I just, you know, sometimes I'll get a student, you know, uh, you know, they've got the Kundalini, it's working through them, and yet they're taking such huge, huge strides. And I'm looking at that, and I'm going, wow, there's, there's very little of a, of a foundation occurring here. This is all basic uh, responding to phenomena, you know, response, 
type of call and response. And uh, and so you know I try to slow that down a little bit and get some get some foundation in, involved in their equation and and that foundation is going to require some sort of work, some sort of effort, some sort of a demand upon their time. And uh, you know they uh, if they're having really challenging phenomena, they typically will will do the work because the the phenomena is so challenging that not doing the the work is out of the question because nothing else will work. Nothing else works except, you know, maybe blotting out your mind with chemicals. Okay. Um, Yeah, it's it's something to consider. You don't want to just allow fear to run rampant in you either. Don't allow yourself to get panicky. That just builds, that feeds on itself. That's like putting out the fire with gasoline. Okay. Don't allow yourself to do that. Allow yourself to to find that technique that you like, maybe some of the ones that I mentioned, and uh, keep your inner calm, your inner serenity intact. That is another excellent way of fear mitigation during the Kundalini Awakening. Not everybody has the same level of emotional understanding, emotional growth, uh, emotional information either. And so based upon those levels of information within the person as they have the kundalini, those are the qualities of, of, uh, of experience that will be uh, um, fueled for expansion. Those are those qualities. Some of the fear mitigations that you'll that you'll uh, that you'll find out happen to you in your Kundalini dreams. So, if you if you're being chased by a big black dog, red eyes, and it wants to bite you, I'm going to say, offer it your arm. You go here, bite this one. Or would you like the left arm? Well, oh, here. Would you like both arms? Here you go. I mean, really, really begin to to not play the fear game. Choose serenity. When Kundalini comes to you as a giant serpent, which it does quite often to folks, uh, it will want to eat you. Let it eat you. Offer yourself. I give myself to you, Kundalini. Offer offer yourself and and get eaten by the giant snake. It's not what you think. I'm not going to ruin it for you, but it's not what you think. (laughs) There's no need to be afraid. The, the biggest thing that you need to watch out for is uh, making making life-changing choices and decisions while you're under a huge level of fear or anxiety. Those are not uh, constructive uh, areas, I think, for decisions of a life-changing quality to be made. Don't just drop your teacher because they're making you work hard. They're supposed to make you work hard. Don't just you know, get fed up with Kundalini because your day is so long and, you know, you've, you, you've got all these other responsibilities stacking up, stacking up, stacking up. Don't short circuit or try to short circuit yourself because uh, it's getting difficult. With Kundalini, stopping doesn't necessarily ease the issue. Stopping doesn't necessarily take out the the uh, the difficulty the degree of difficulty it doesn't it just puts it on hold for a moment maybe that's what you need that one little moment I will suggest that you try to change your life to suit the Kundalini rather than having the you know you know try to change your Kundalini to suit your life don't do it that way. And I understand the, uh, you know, the, the, when you have small kids in the house, little children, you know, they're, they're going to take up a lot of your attention. But that doesn't disqualify a Kundalini Awakening event, or you wouldn't be having it and have small children at the same time. Okay. You wouldn't be having that. Uh, if anybody has any questions about this or any other subject, please feel free to call 347 347- Nine three four zero zero two six.
Okay. Uh, let's see here. Somebody's talking about Washington. Hmm. Let's see here. Hello, Eileen. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Tell me about you and, and your. how would you f- mitigate your fear when you were out here in California? Oh, I didn't do very well. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. Don't judge yourself harshly. You know, well, we're all... So how, how, how did that change your equation? Did you make your choices out of fear? And if you did... Uh, did that thing? Did that make things better or worse? Initially, my choices were not made out of fear, but then I allowed the fear to uh, uh, come. I allowed the fear to uh, grow in me, I guess, and then the choices were made out of fear, and I feel that they were not good choices. Um, there's been a lot of changes since then, but as I'm listening to you, I I don't I don't really don't think in terms of fear. <laughs> I don't I don't feel I really feel it. Every once in a while, if something's physical, I'm it's a lot of emotional, a lot of physical things, and if something physical starts occurring in, in my body, initially I go, oh no, what is this? But then I remember, well, this is Kundalini, so it doesn't, you know, so then it doesn't matter. Um, I have to keep reminding myself <laughs> that, that, it's, that it is Kundalini and everything that's happening is Kundalini. Um, that's a good thing. But no, there mind. have been times I've made some bad choices. And, oh, you uh, made, made bad choices? Challenging choices? Yes. We all do, my dear. We all we all do. Don't there's no no shame in that. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so when sometimes when we're faced and thank you, I mean I'm putting you in the blue. Sometimes when we're faced with uh with you know, really life altering decisions. Now Eileen, you know, she she was an East Coast girl and a West Coast girl and an East Coast girl and a West Coast girl and now she's back to being an East Coast girl. We'll see. Hopefully that will last longer. Uh but I think, yeah, I think she's really kind of paid her dues in this regard. I think it's really helped her to to look at her fears and to make better choices uh, now than, you know, of course, back back when she was going from from coast to coast. So, once again, folks, you know, as you as you mitigate your fears, so do you amplify that quality of, of balance. And yes, I was reading what uh, Fasci also said about fear mitigation is that trust. Trust is also very important. Trust is a is a slippery thing, though. You know, I mean, yeah, people have to agree with you typically in order to trust you. Uh, you know, you know, in 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 the common you know camaraderie, camaraderie friendly way that that we would trust other people. For me, these days, the the the, the quality and clarity and the the. The feelings within information is what allows me to have a, a degree of trust. All of that being fueled and fed by the Kundalini. Uh, you know, you know about certain things, and so you know, you, you, you get a very clear signal, and that also helps to mitigate your fear. That also helps to mitigate your fear. So this is really what I wanted to talk about today, and I'm going to go ahead and end this this episode earlier. I have some some work I have to do outside. I can't I can't get it done in the dark. So I'd like to say thank you to everyone for coming to this to this abbreviated version of of our blog talk radio. Um, I look for I'll be in different locations uh, this for the next three weeks. I'll be in different locations every time uh, we we do the blog talk, and so I'll have this iPad with me. And I think it'll it'll work just fine. I'm hopeful anyway. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody who called in, Centara, Rosemary, Eileen, and Josephine, and uh, everybody that's on the uh, chat room, Julie, Elizabeth, Bashi, Guest, and Mike Strong. Thank you, everyone, for 
joining us today, and I look forward for the full two hours a week from today. Thanks for listening.